moment to thank a number of people who've really been very helpful in, in putting it all together. Uh, we've had a number of uh, student hosts who have been uh, here to help uh, our guests and to organize the student part of the colloquium series. Uh, and uh, they've all been very helpful. Jason was the person who was uh, the uh, student host for today. Um, I also wanted to thank, even though she's not here, I want to thank uh, Abby for the tremendous amount of work that uh, she has done in helping to coordinate and organize uh, the, the series. We have two people over here who have also put in a tremendous amount of, uh, of time and energy into making this a success, Jeff Baum and Diane Duffman. And uh, I also think it's appropriate to thank uh, Patty and, uh, and Jeff Cowan for their uh, support uh, financially for this series to make it possible to bring people in from all around the country to, to visit us. So if you don't mind, let's put our hands together for those people who are here. Today. As we do every for every one of these lectures, we have a faculty host. And the faculty host for Tom has been Tom Hollihan and Tom will uh, thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge Jason Ingram, who is the graduate student host who uh, coordinated the events. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a forecast of what's in store for today. First of all, we're, uh, we're honored that we're able to combine some exciting events. We have the colloquial speaker, uh, Professor Farrell, who I'll introduce in a moment. And then we're going to follow this session after a 10 or 15 minute recess with a panel of uh, Walt's former students who no doubt are going to take revenge for all the kind of things he said to them on their, on their many dissertation chapters throughout the course of their program of study. And they will all be cheered on, no doubt, from all the rest of us, <laughs> who have also had the good pleasure to have Walt edit the manuscripts and things for us. So uh, then we'll, uh, we'll, after those presentations, uh, quickly want to adjourn for cocktails in the faculty center, and uh, the cocktails will be followed by dinner. At some point in the evening, we will give Fisher a chance to respond to the uh, respondents, but we may make him wait until he's had a few drinks before we do that, <laughs> because his criticisms soften a little bit <laughs> after some alcohol. It is, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the colloquium today, Professor Tom Farrell, who's Professor of Communication in the School of Speech at Northwestern University. He earned a PhD from the University of Wisconsin. He was an assistant professor actually at USC a long, long time ago, 1973 to 1974, um, which, which explains the gray hair, <laughs> uh, gray beard at least, not, not the gray hair. So no issues here at all. <laughs> we're we're going to lay easy on the elderly jokes today. This is no time for picking on old people. <laughs> Tom, Tom is the author of the book, Norms of Rhetorical Culture, published by the Yale University Press. He also edited two leading volumes on rhetoric, Landmarks of Contemporary Rhetoric, and the Oxford Encyclopedia. <coughs> He's the author of more than 70 articles and chapters in the leading journals of the field, including the Quarterly Journal of Speech, Communication Monographs, Philosophy and Rhetoric, the Western Journal of Speech, Communication, and Text and Performance Quarterly. For those of you squishy performance types, this is just from the back He is uh, he is the winner of, of several of the NCA slash SCA's most important awards, including the Monograph Award, the Charles Wilbert Award, the Winans Witchelms Award, all named for dead white males, I might note. Um, Tom has worked at the forefront of rhetorical theory and criticism on topics ranging from philosophical inquiry to pragmatic and political discourse. So it's a great honor for him. Uh, and for us to be here to celebrate the career of Walt Fisher today. His topic is Through a Glass Lightly, we don't have to inquire about what was in the glass, a report on the state of appearance and the appearances of state. Tom. Thank you, Tom. I was going to call this talk, but enough about you, Walter. But uh, I think that's already been covered in the introduction, so I really want to thank uh, Tom for that very gracious introduction. Uh, uh, first of all, allow me to thank our hosts and, of course, the man himself for allowing me to be here. Walter has such a legion of fans and friends that I'm a little shocked. I feel a little bit like the person to be best man or maid of honor. 
um, the person out of the wedding cake turns out to be me. Uh, but I relish the engagement, and I'm eager to be a surrogate for so many of you who would no doubt and will offer your own eloquent testimony to, Wal to Walter's influence. Um, Walter has meant an awful lot to me over the years. Um, and it's a, it's a real honor for me to celebrate his contributions to our field. Uh, but more than anything, I think Walter is deserving of praise for being the first person to figure out that the presidency is a rhetorical fiction. <laughs> I'll pause if you like. <laughs> you want confirmation? Find Dick Cheney's bunker. Uh, but this is only one of his many remarkable accomplishments. Tonight I want to revisit Walter's work by celebrating those mysterious things that rhetoricians do um, when we're practicing our profession. And may, th this may help us get a little bit of a grip on some of Walter's contributions to our field. Before I do that, though, I also want to bring greetings from far and wide. Uh, my wife, who is Walter's PhD student, deeply regrets not being able to be here. Uh, she wanted everyone to know that. She want, also wanted everyone to know that this is largely my fault. Um, this is called marriage. Um, this, the second thing I want to do is bring greetings for my, my own son, my own Tom, um, who is still at, at 17 years of age trying to figure out how Walter can pull a quarter out of his ear so mysteriously. <laughs> um, there are many rhetoricians, but there's only one magician rhetorician, and that rhetorician would be Walter. Uh, so later tonight we'll do the roast, but what we're doing now, and it starts immediately, is the toast. The key to my tribute is that we rhetoricians earn our bread by grappling with appearances. These, at least in my view, and welcome, are the real materials of rhetoric. That's probably why, over time, dualistic, idealistic philosophies have always kept rhetoric right within their crosshairs. Where there are appearance reality dualisms, rhetoric is often seen to be a sham art, making the worst case appear to be the better, and so forth. So Plato dissed us, so did, Kant, so did the modern heirs of tr such traditions, even Habermas, who I'm pleased to acknowledge I've stopped writing about. Um, to defend rhetoric is to take seriously its pursuit as an art, a craft, and a practice. Essentially, it is to reacquaint ourselves with at least the plausible integrity of appearances and what we might make of them, how we might deal with them. A few years back in my Norms book, I made an attempt to argue for the integrity and legitimacy of rhetorical materials of appearance. But anybody who struggled through that tome knows that I kind of gave up the ghost midway through the third chapter. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm returning to the topic here. The other reason is while I don't wish to be doing polemics, uh, my title kind of gives the game away. Um, I do believe that we as a rhetorical culture have been waltzing, jumping, skipping gleefully into the biggest green room in world history, the old panopticon. Uh, which is back, the culture of surveillance. The reason I call it a green room is a little note of appreciation to the Naderites that I'll help this happen. Uh, so this is intended to be something of a dance of categories. Should it get to be tiresome, and I've been known to get that way, do me a favor and raise your hand and we will talk. I think that is within the 901 club spirit that Walter helped to foster uh, so long ago. Um, so this is actually about a tribute to my mentor. Rhetoric emerges when appearances collide with eventfulness, when captions, themes, and conventions require explanation and engagement. One of the great mistakes philosophy has made about these undervalued materials of rhetoric is to assume that appearances are only one thing, a sham, an illusion, whatever. They have to be either accepted or rejected, and these are the only options. Even Kenneth Burke makes that mistake, at least early on in his work, when he talks about frames of rejection and frames of acceptance. Tom Goodnight and I are teaching attitudes toward history these days. Tom thinks there should be a third frame called frames of ambivalence. Um, we have a raging pedantic debate about this because I think ambivalence is when you're between frames, which is what we are most of the time. Uh, it isn't just one thing or another. It's different modalities of engagement. Um, and these are not the only options. There are many other options, and Walter has explored so many of them. Um, one, of, one of the texts that I tend to foist upon graduate students um, 
and that I think all of us at some point need to lead, uh, read, and become acquainted with, is this collection of essays by Walter Benjamin, another Walter, the European Walter, uh, called Illuminations. It is a series of critical essays that had the good fortune of being edited by Hannah Arendt. But if you're going to have an editor, that's a good editor to have. <laughs> These are essays that in every way are seminal, and the very order in which the essays are, off are offered to me is illustrative of what rhetorical theorists and critics actually do. So let me take a few moments, and I'm going to just spin this out without much of an actual text, uh, to tell you a little bit about the order of these essays, because I think they say something important about what theorists and rhetoric do. The first little essay is called Unpacking My Library. Okay? Some of you may have read it. Uh, it follows a brilliant introduction by Hannah Arendt herself. Um, that alone is worth the price of admission. But this will give you some sense of the flavor of Walter Benjamin. Here are the first few lines. I am unpacking my library. Yes, I am. The books are not yet on the shelves, not yet touched by the mild boredom of order. I cannot march up and down their ranks to pass them in review before a friendly audience. You not, need not fear any of that. Instead, I must ask you to join me in the disorder of crates that have been wrenched open the air saturated with the dust or wood, the floor covered with burned paper. If you were to read this essay with the wrong med medicinal aids or in the wrong state of consciousness, you could go directly around the bend. <laughs> this is an essay that is not about the library. This is an essay about collecting. It's about book collecting. And the library, its arbitrariness and the age after Babel and everything else is something that Benjamin writes about in a brilliant allegorical way. What is the theorist and critic first and foremost? If you read Benjamin, the critic is first and foremost a collector. The critic is a person who appreciates works of art, books, and in this case, rhetoric. The critic is somebody who tries to do what I would call appreciative criticism. And I mean that term literally and figuratively. I mean value-added criticism. I mean when you finish engaging the work of art, the work of rhetoric, it should have more significance, not less. All through his career, Walter has done that. And so in my view, first and foremost, Walter is a theorist of rhetoric as a collector, somebody who treasures artifacts, somebody who brings our attention to them, somebody that helps us appreciate them further. The second essay, okay, and again, I don't know that any of you would have ordered them this way, but Arendt certainly does a nice job doing it is the task of the translator. Um, to cut to the chase, the critic is a translator. The critic is somebody who takes the artifacts that sometimes seem outside the purview of our own understanding and helps to explain them in a language that the public can grasp. Uh, and that is one of the ways in which the critic and theorist enters into the conversation that is ordinary public life. And I don't need to tell you that Walter has been uh, a great theorist and critic as a the third essay is called The Storyteller. And here I don't think it's going to take too much effort for us to see the way that Walt Fisher, probably more than any other rhetorician, has given us a framework for intervening in the ongoing sequence of appearances as a storyteller, as a narrator, as somebody who helps us see ways of giving impetus, direction, and appreciation to the unfolding sequence of appearances that we have. And there is one more um, that is the essay everyone should read, I mean, probably more than once. It's the most famous essay Benjamin ever wrote. It's called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. I think a lot of us are familiar with that as well. When Benjamin wrote the essay, he was interested in something that he thought was the disappearance of authenticity in the culture of reproduction. Nowadays, I think we have something different to worry about, quite a bit different to worry about, and that's the problem of circulation. The critic is a circulator. The critic is somebody who also chronicles the way in which texts reproduce themselves, the way texts go from one venue to another, the way different publics contest them, the way different meanings are teased out of them. Um, I say this is important, so that's what I'm going to do with Benjamin, but I want to give you a couple of illustrations. I think in our own age of mechanical reproduction, it is all too easy to assume that everything that can be circulated has been circulated, 
that everything that can be seen is being seen, that there aren't things that are somehow missing from the reproductive apparatus that is our culture. This is as close as I ever get to critical studies, so bear with me. Uh, I want to give you a couple of personal anecdotes and illustrations because I think they're, they're relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, they're all documentaries, and they're all disappeared documentaries. They've come back, I'm pleased about that, but let me tell you about what happened to them. Um, a few years back, actually quite a few years back, I was at uh, a parent-teacher conference. Uh, my son was in kindergarten, that's how many years back that is. Um, and uh, it also happened to be Black History Month. And so in one classroom, they had you know 100 people watching Michael Jordan's playground. But in another classroom, they had about three or four people watching a videotape documentary called Paul Robeson, Portrait of an Artist. Now, I had never seen it, although for many years, I'd been a great fan of Paul Robeson and actually was reproducing his book, Here I Stand, when it was out of print or just about everything else that Robeson was. Um, but I was very taken with this documentary, and so I tried to get a hold of it. What happened is one of the parents complained about it. It was pulled from the video store, at least where I lived, and for at least 10 years, I could never get a hold of it. I finally, I finally found it through a textile workers group in Massachusetts on the 100th anniversary of Paul Robeson's birth. Okay. That's how it came back into my possession, and that's how it was reproduced. I bring up this little anecdote because it's an ironic reduplication of what happened in Robeson's own life. I mean, this is a guy who, because of his radical sympathies, and he never even was a communist, he just criticized racism, was not allowed to leave the United States during the entire 1950s. It went so far, he was an all-American, a Renaissance man, Illinois State University. They went back and removed his name as an all-American for two consecutive years because of his sympathies. And so long after that happened, long after he was a prisoner in his own country, you can't even get a hold of his document. So anecdote number one. Anecdote number two, um, I teach rhetorical history. I do World War II to so more or less the present. Um, there was a documentary film made during World War II by no less a director than John Huston. Uh, you may be familiar with that. It's called The, the Battle of San Pietro. Uh, it was actually violated in many of the conventions of documentaries that showed actual GIs dying and interview people who were going to be dead later on and so forth. That documentary was never shown for 40 years. It finally won an Academy Award for Best Documentary in the 1970s. It did not serve okay. um, And there are many, many such cases. So I guess the point I would try to make here is that the critic is, the theorist is all of these things. The theorist is um, a collector, the theorist is a translator, the theorist is a storyteller, and the theorist is a circulator. And it's real important for us to pay attention to what does circulate and what doesn't. The last example I was going to use, which I'll just gloss over, is the argument of McCarthy hearings, uh, which finally came out and had been to the set in the last couple of years. Uh, so now I can finally teach stuff that I think are among the most important documentary events of the war in post four years that help us understand our history, that help us understand how we have evolved over time. Um, so that's kind of part number one that I want to do. I don't want to go on too long. Uh, part number two, I want to do my own little bit of a narrative here uh, to lead up to the issue of surveillance, which is, after all, my topic. Um, and part of this narrative has to do with the gap with frames of acceptance and frames of rejection. Uh, when Good Night and I are doing our Attitudes of History course, um, we start off with uh, Kenneth Burke and the three figures he looks at at the beginning are Walt Whitman, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and William James. And they all do basically frames of acceptance. Well, you could start with other figures as well. And a part of my little project is to uh, look at, at three other 19th century, 20th century figures who are much more ambivalent than the ones that Burke decided to use. They are Henry David Thoreau, um, Phineas T. Barnum, <laughs> and Ida B. Wells. And I really don't totally understand why everyone in the 19th century had these three names, but they all seem to have. You know, even Ralph Waldo Emerson has Waldo in the middle, right? Um, but just to start briefly with them, 
Uh, Henry David Thoreau, we all know from all of the slogans that have been excerpted from Walden and put on t-shirts in the 60s, the majority of people their lives of what is it, desperation, quiet desperation, uh, and people march to the beat of a different drummer, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Walden is actually a very long work, and those excerpts do not do justice or injustice to the experience of trying to read it. Uh, I think the only person who ever read it was Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> I mean, to read it is like reading a phone book. Well, this morning I saw that the ice had frosted over. Um, Thoreau was an interesting counter reading to Ralph Waldo Emerson because Thoreau really didn't like the 19th century. He didn't like anything about it. He didn't like progress. He didn't like the railroads. He didn't like industrialization. And most important, he didn't like people. You know? That's why I kept moving away from him all the time. What he loved, he was a guy in love with a pond. You know, when you think about that. Um, he becomes an ambivalent personality, in my view at least, because what he was trying to elude is what he inevitably could not escape, which is the public. And actually, it's fascinating to me that he's become something of a public heroic persona as we move from the 19th century to the 20th century. The second person I just want to mention to you um, as part of my narrative uh, is Phineas T. Barnum, who in all likelihood, uh, Thoreau and Barnum had been in the same drawing room for more than 30 minutes, and one of them would have been dead. Everything that Thoreau hated about the 19th century, Barnum loved. You know, let's, let's show weirdos, you know? Let's do um, celebrity stunts. Let's do publicity rituals. Uh, Barnum is a famous but underappreciated rhetorician because he founded the circus, the spectacle, the touring uh, stage group, okay? and many, many more things that I can't even recall here. But he was the ultimate Philistine. And if Thoreau was stuck with the negative kind of in a personal vein that he couldn't explain, get away from, Phineas T. Barnum decided to put the negative right out there for all of us to see. Look, here's a dwarf, here's a guy with two heads, here's a this, here's a that. And so the stigma was celebrated as a, as a really source of entertainment. What Phineas T. Barnum gives us, again, I don't think inadvertently this time, I think quite deliberately, is the second con contested term of weights and measures in the 20th century, which is the spectacle. Okay. If Thoreau yields the public, Barnum yields the spectacle. And you might, if you're dialectically inclined, think about these two things as fighting it out during a lot of the 20th century as a series of weights and measures and how we measure controversy and significance narratively, collectively, translatingly, circulatingly, however. Okay? But I, I'm not really a dialectician. I'm a Catholic, and so I have three terms. <laughs> um, my, my third term actually is one that Ida B. Wells, who's a personal heroine of mine, uh, helped to found. Um, those people who argue against reparations, and I'm not necessarily arguing for them, but one thing should be remembered is that slavery didn't end in 1865. From 1865 to the late 1950s, there were 5,763 lynchings. Until the late 1950s, lynching was entirely legal. There was no federal law against lynching. Ida B. Wells was an African-American woman born into a family of slaves. As a 19th century woman, as many people did, she experienced extraordinary tragedy just like that. In one week, with yellow fever, she lost both her mother, her father, and two of her siblings. She was largely uneducated. She had to raise her own family, and she did. She got a job as a teacher. Every single thing that Thoreau hated about the 19th century, Ida Wells used to advance herself, to advance her life, and to advance her cause. Her cause, single-minded beyond belief, was the cause of lynching. Um, Ida B. Wells argued a case before the Illinois Supreme Court. Ida B. Wells, um, when, when the white churches wouldn't talk about lynching, she talked to the black churches. When they wouldn't talk about it, she started her own newspaper, which helped to found the NAAC. And when that didn't work, they burned it down. She went to England to argue and preach from a foreign country about the problems in America involving race. So, if Thoreau inadvertently gives us the public, and if 
Um, Phineas T. Barnum very deliberately gives us the spectacle. Ida B. Wells gives us the third contested term that America has still not embraced, not only late in the 20th century, but early in the 21st, and that's the idea of a forum. A forum that is broader than the singularity of the public. A forum that is broader than the sovereignty of a nation. A forum that allows you to expand the gathering places of argument and discourse. We haven't gotten there yet. But I think that that's still a term that's being contested in our um, So that's my, that's my little narrative. And I think the little narrative leads to some questions and some interests basically about surveillance. Um, when the public turns into a spectacle, surveillance has occurred. When the forum is denied and stories are left untold, surveillance becomes increasingly impossible because we don't really have an opportunity to reflect upon the appearances we're given because we're not even given them anymore. So it's at this point that I want to turn to the video, um, which I'm going to talk about kind of allegorically. Um, and you can close that because I scream at blank anyway, so that's when all the adventure really starts. Um, the video I'm going to do, the excerpt I'm going to do is from a film that I think helps to introduce the whole theme of surveillance and appearances. Uh, it is the part, an excerpt from the movie American Beauty. American Beauty is a difficult film to like, but I think it's an extremely evocative and provocative film. Um, you probably all know the story of Lester Burnham if you've seen the movie. He's a basically tapped out guy, I think that's why he's called Burnham, um, who's uh, middle-aged, whose life is empty, whose wife, who's, who's very gender biased in that sense, his wife is sort of Martha Stewart from hell, uh, and his life is essentially a series of poses that she creates. Okay? Um, the whole movie is really about appearances and different ways of dealing with appearances. Lester Burnham decides in the middle of his life to stage what looks like a rebellion against the appearances that have been posed for him in his life. But if you think about his rebellion, it consists of buying a firebird, working out, smoking primo weed, working in a McDonald's, and fantasizing about a cheerleader. All in all, not a terror, not storming the Bastille, folks. <laughs> this rebellion could very easily be seen as infantile repression. And I think the fact of the matter is that the movie has such a dire view of appearances as posed that Burnham's rebellion actually takes on the mode of something superior and more authentic by the very fact that he decides to retrograde to adolescence, if you will. Um, this is a movie where the single most erotic scene in the film, which I'm not going to show you because this is a family audience, uh, the single most erotic scene in the film consists of a situation with Lester's daughter. She was being stalked by a person with a video camera. And she decides to actually disrobe and disclose before the video camera. But this is not that scene. So um, but just watch it for a little bit. Of it. This is the stalker. exhibition, okay, exposure as disclosure, in an era that is dominated by appearances and is dominated by spectacle, I think part of the response to spectacle is to simply exhibit ourselves to it. 
And that's why we have currently 27 different reality TV shows. Okay. Um, so if I can begin to inch toward a conclusion here, why have we skippingly, willingly, happily waltzed into a surveillance culture? Uh, my answer to that would be threefold. And thank you, Beverly. Um, and my answer to that would be, the first and foremost, we have become an exhibitionist culture largely dominated by generational differences. Um, I found some fascinating data that basically said that uh, people my age are terrified of their privacy being invaded, but people who are between the ages of 17 and 25 don't care. Now, that's odd, and I'm not criticizing people between the ages of 17 and 25, I'm, but I am just saying that, that there is a fascinating sort of thing going on here. Um, I think what's going on partly is an issue of memory, and the response to that is simply an issue of re reality TV, MTV, real world. Uh, it, I mean, it is a situation where largely, um, first of all, I think we've denied privacy to begin with with adolescents who need it in order to become autonomous and mature. Um, and secondly, they don't care, largely, because they've been surrounded by situations in which you perform for each other. And as you can see from American Beauty, at least a little bit I did, when the video camera's pointed at you, it's just as easy to say, hey, sailor, you know, and perform back for the video camera. Uh, if you don't believe that, uh, think about my idea for a reality TV show called Older Brother. <laughs> and instead of having uh, the MTV generation perform, you'd have Gertrude treating her varicose veins. <laughs> How many people do you think would want to watch that? <laughs> that depends on Gertrude. Okay. Good point. Good point and good answer. Right? Um, I think the allegory is sort of like if you, I mean, I've been really thrown out of school three times for doing the Britney Spears Pepsi commercial, but if you think about that commercial, you've got this extremely nubile young person essentially engaged in various forms of simulated fellation of a Pepsi bottle while Bob Viagra Dole watches <laughs> with his dog that obviously isn't his dog. You know, and says, down boy. I mean, what it really is, is it's younger generation performing for a voyeuristic older generation. So that'd be like reason number one. Reason number two, uh, I think, of why we have waltzed willingly and happily into uh, the biggest green room in world history, I think has to do with the gang that couldn't shoot straight theory. That is to say, um, there is a widespread rumor that the current administration is not necessarily made up of rocket scientists. Um, and so, you know, and after the, the worst intelligence disaster in American world history, uh, it will take a while before we get to the bottom of that. But um, to give you an example, this is from USA Today, intelligence agencies put their heads together. I think if you put all the heads of all the intelligence agencies <laughs> together, you might possibly get one head. But it wouldn't be, you know, a terribly full and fertile one. And so, two things kind of come to mind from this. First of all, can you speak truth to power if there's a widespread suspicion that the power is dumber than my left shoe? I'm not sure. <laughs> question number two, and it's not really a question, it's more like a proposition, never underestimate the damage that can be done in the dominion of the dumb. Because surveillance agencies never voluntarily take themselves out of service. Okay, the examples that I gave you earlier, McCarthy, the Army McCarthy hearings, he had to be censored by the Senate, by Congress, for that Committee on House American Activities to go to power. And Mitchell Palmer did not go quiet. And in every previous case of surveillance, it has never been the case that somebody has voluntarily decided, well, I don't need to do and reason number three, and this is one that I really am very ambivalent about myself, so it's not just those 19th century figures who are really good one, um, is something that I would simply call the elusiveness of the object or the reference. I personally feel that the closer you look at things, the more you magnify them, the less you see quite often. We had a ton of cameras trained on Atlanta at the Atlanta bombing, which don't exactly sure we did it, we have suspicions. We had tons of eyewitness testimony and tons of footage of the TWA bombing. We still don't know who did it. Um, we have, as everyone around here knows, extraordinary footage and slow motion of Rodney King getting the bejesus beaten out of him 
And the closer you look at it and the more you break down the tape, you can interpret it very differently from that. And obviously the World Trade Center bombing. Where we currently have thousands of detainees and exactly one more. Uh, now I say I'm ambivalent about this, and the reason I basically am is on one hand it's heartening because it suggests that, that it's possible that we can still resist this increasing magnification on aspects of our lives. On the other hand, I find it disheartening because what all three of these things lack as explanations is something I would call vision. Looking closely at things does not always give you the big picture. Okay. Exhibiting yourself often gives no picture. And being unafraid of power because you actually have a certain degree of contempt for the degree of intelligence in power lets you leave the picture without even seeing its full implications. So I guess I've become polemical despite myself. But I would like to close by saying that the one person who has given us an example of vision as a collector, as a translator, as a storyteller, and a circulator in due proportion is the man we're honoring today, um, and that would be Walter Fisher. So thank you, Walter, and thank you. I'm sure that Professor Farrell would uh, love to entertain some questions. Professor Farrell's adrenaline is running at such a level that he could be used as rocket fuel. So anything, you do, anything you do to settle me down, I would really appreciate it. Right? <laughs> You're probably right about that. say, well, Ed just goes with a bald head and gray hair. But Tom is a distinguished professor, and he doesn't have gray hair, at least on the top. You get your best to give it to me. <laughs> the, the second thing is, at, at one point when I was editing the quarterly journal of speech, where I published an article by Tom Farrell, I was told that some young person had come along and said, something to the effect that I was only publishing the material from my friends. And I, all I could think to say was, I'm sure glad I have brilliant friends. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. Th this earns an anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought about this. I thought of doing the whole talk of anecdotes because I have a million of them. But uh, I was there at the birth of the narrative period. I think you could probably argue that to some degree I was the midwife for the Mary Fair. Walter and I were driving in his wonderfully safe Volkswagen bus. It doesn't even have a motor in the front of it to protect you and you collapse like a balloon in foil. We're, we're driving from um, Alta, Utah to Boulder to visit Tom Friends, okay? And as you probably know if you've ever made that trip, many of you have, you have to go through mountains or ravines you know, valleys, uh, you know, Utah and Colorado, right? So here we are driving through this area, and Walter's gotten very fascinated with the area. So it's raining sideways. It's dark. You can't see the road. And along the side of the road are signs that say stuff like, Go back! <laughs> <laughs> Flash flood warning! Go to higher ground! You know, stuff like this, right? And Walter is going, well, you know, if I hear the fidelity, what I really mean is that. He looks over and he says, you're not writing this down. <laughs> I said, I'm saying my rosary, Walter. <laughs> I said, well, you <laughs> that's, that's a little bit exaggerated, but it's fairly close, <laughs> it's fairly close to true. You know, you know how it gets when he really gets caught up in an idea. And here's another thing. <laughs> but there are many such anecdotes. Um, I'd be happy to amplify or you know minimize or whatever you, whatever you'd like. <laughs> <laughs>
This yeah. is not a question, Tom, but a comment. One of my students, the, the topic of the Bob Dole commercial came up in my class the other night. One of my students who works for a marketing company claims, I don't know if this is an exaggeration or not, that they actually didn't have the dog next to Dole at first in the commercial, and that they focus grouped it with Down Boy Down without the presence of the dog or the dog That pack. would be bad. And then said, this, this did not test well, and added, and added the dog and the head tap. So, well, I wouldn't really know, but I have to say this was a situation calling for an additional signifier. <laughs> summer there was this explosion of things called like Big Brother and all of that and people with longer memories thought gee this is just a little bit scary you know and and other people and a lot of people like really got caught up in it, Survivor and everything else um, and it was at the, the beginning of that in fact there was a lot of new, there was a New York Times magazine article there was a lot of different stuff it was called summer of surveillance now, it's kind of interesting to me that the summer of surveillance was just about a year and a half before we actually entered into political surveillance big time. And I guess my point, which is to elaborate a little bit, is I think that, that we've been remarkably amicable and, and compliant about that fact. Um, and these things are difficult to roll back over time. I mean, um, I imagine this is going to seem really polemical to some of you, but what I would say is that the strongest voices against this are actually coming from conservatives, people like William Sapphire, Thomas Friedman. Uh, they're not coming from liberals. They don't mind the Patriot Act. They don't mind the stuff. Put security on anything that you can sell. Um, so I, I'm actually jumping the bridge here and joining the, sort of the neoconservatives and the older conservatives to say I think these things really do matter over time. And I think if because of the panopticon, because of the degree of exhibitionism in our culture, we just haven't had the normal resistance to that that you might have seen in other contexts. I'm just wondering if that's what it takes to have solidity. So it's sort of those things, it's sort of at the anecdotal level would be there now. So yeah, I, this is not science. I'm thinking is this, <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I'm thinking as this evolves, I can see it going in different directions. I mean, that's one type of thing that Big Brother type of show, but I'm thinking stuff like identity theft, that's a, the ultimate surveillance in a way. Right. I think I don't think you're going to see big generational differences on that. I that. In fact, the people will be the big victims of that, the people who are younger now, the older ones will make it dead, you know, it's really <laughs> generalized. A, the, there was a thing on uh, CNN this morning by Jeannie Moose, or Moose, or whoever she is, I love her, she's hilarious. She did this thing on a uh, like a, it's not even a dating service that's weirder than that. There, there's some bar in New York where, and I guess there's more than one, they call them like the virtual lounges or something. Where what you do is you plug into things and surveil other people. And when you see somebody whose visual image appears worth surveilling further, presumably at some weird point that we don't know, your relationship may go from virtual to something else. But the, the story that was amazing is she told, and this is more anecdotal stuff for you, she told a story about a woman who was like sort of actively engaged in the old wet t-shirt ritual of disrobing, sitting next to a bunch of guys who were watching her on a video camera while she was there, okay? <laughs> That's modern etiquette. <laughs> <laughs> Never try to one-up a humor <laughs> <laughs> well, it just struck me as interesting. Although, uh, what? Oh, did you? Sure. He's been working behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to me to show my visual aid, you know, 15 minutes after I'm done. <laughs>
<laughs> um, it's from the posing of appearances to the disclosing of appearances. There's actually a scene early in the film um, that at the time I thought was gratuitous where the daughter is contemplating uh, breast augmentation surgery or something. Uh, that becomes kind of interesting in light of the fact that, that she's actually disclosing and exhibiting uh, aspects of her body that she feels are flawed. And so I think in the context of the film, the way the film works, um, that, that we actually reach the point where a certain kind of frame disclosure seems to be more authentic than the appearances we've inherited. Um, and and there, there's just no doubt about it. I mean, I, this is more anecdotal stuff, but I think that, that the daughter is the most sympathetic person in the film, by far, I and mean, even Lester. They, they do everything in the world to try and make you sympathetic to him, but it's pretty hard to be. And that her rebellion is actually more disclosure. Um, and it is from inhibition to exhibition, and it's exhibition to rebellion. And it seemed to be as maybe the only erotic scene in the whole film. Um, so yeah, I'm glad we actually did get to that, because it's a, it's a breakthrough moment in the film. And it's actually the reason they start bonding as, as friends, and not even necessarily as lovers, but as co-watchers. I mean, they film each other. They take pictures of things in the street. They sit down and watch them together. And it's really an interesting sort of view. I mean, it, it just it kind of says that in this day and age, where we are is, is the response to appearances to different framing systems of appearances. Um, anyway, I'm glad we got it. Stephen. Um, <coughs> this is a question, not a comment. Um, I was curious about the connection you're making between uh, the commercial culture of exhibitionism with Surveillance Summer, shows like Big Brother and Survivor, and so-called reality television now, uh, where I, mean, I think there's a number of different examples of this. Uh, I don't watch much television. I'm too busy being a communication scholar. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when, I, when I watch this, uh, there's one of these cop shows where the uh, cameras follow the cops into the house and it's like spousal abuse or whatever the messy situation is that the cops have done to clean up. Uh, I'm really struck by the ease with which people acquiesce in the filming of these terrible moments of their private lives without the cameras there. Now there have been lawsuits or cases where people protested this, mm -hmm. but uh, people watch the shows and then if the cops come to their door with a the camera, they are familiarized with it and so things are a little bit more open to that kind of disclosure. Mm -hmm. But how do we go from cop shows and reality television and Survivor to the political culture post 9-11, which brings us the Patriot Act and uh, John Ashcroft and uh, the uh, you know, erosion of our civil liberties? And I, I'm a little bit unclear about uh, how you see that transition or the way the political culture and the entertainment culture dovetail or don't. Well, I mean, to be very simplistic about it, I, what I guess what I'm arguing is that the entertainment culture uh, eased our way into the political culture over time. Uh, I also, and, and I do think it's partly generational, although I would really be happy to stand corrected. I mean, I have a 17-year-old kid who has buddy chats and all kinds of stuff that go on, which is just fine, but we sort of moved him to the basement just so he could have some privacy. I think the kids are so used to just not having a private life uh, always being on display, whether it's in sports or whatever else it is, or, or just doing video uh, virtual exchanges with each other. Um, so I, I'm basically arguing, and it's, and it's not even, it's more of a speculation than anything else. I think that what's happened is we've paved the way as a kind of slippery slope into a largely unreflective acceptance of that kind of culture. Um, and it's, it's involved close scrutiny of minutia, which is one of the reasons why it's easy enough to not worry about it. I mean, people, you know, I'm always pulled out of line in security all the time, and I really don't think I'm that suspicious, but they always do it. And, uh, you know, they look in my shoes, they look in my cap, they look in my pockets, they, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, you're not going to stop something by doing that. You know, I mean, it gives you the illusion that things are actually I'm just trying to be a little bit more speculative about how I think our commercial culture is done. Uh, Not blaming Britney Spears for, 
you know, the surveillance culture. But I'm saying that there is a kind of allegory there for how we um, have become so compliant. Um, William Sapphire has this great, um, God, I can't believe I'm writing this. But William Sapphire has this great column called The Great Unwatched. I followed another great column by him on Kangaroo Reports. Um, his, his point about the Great Unwatched is if you want to visit the Washington Monument right now or the Lincoln Memorial, there probably will be 200 different cameras trained on your every inch. Now, I mean, I don't care. I could go like that or something. I mean, I could respond in the same defined way. But there is something that's a little bit disturbing as a precedent for that. Uh, and his argument is, gee, you know, in the country, you ought to be able to go and see the line without being seen more than you're seen. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of random. Where I'll get to, I have no idea. But um, I think the more important thing I'm trying to just point to is that I think uh, rhetorical theorists and critics have a kind of responsibility to get into the middle of this stuff. And Walter has been a good example of that, in my view. Can I push a bit further on this? I know this sort of, I don't know, I, I had the experience the other day of being called by uh, a reporter from the Daily Trojan uh, who was writing an article on web journals and this uh, baffling tendency of his own generation to put intimate details of their private lives up on the web for everybody to see. And so he's looking for an Annenberg professor who will comment on this, and I guess he went through the uh, Rolodex, he got hold of me. And so, That's how busy you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my comment was something along the lines of, gee, why would anybody want to put their private life up there for the world to see? And I came across as kind of like an old fogey. I think there is very much a reinforcing the generational aspect of what you uh, are, are pushing on. But I guess what I want to push on a little bit further is to say, how does it happen that entertainment prepares us for that shift in our political culture with regards specifically to this generation and its political sympathies or activities or inactivities? I mean, I think that there is a really important question here about the way that these uh, media are readying us for maybe much worse to come. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that there are quite as comfortable with the Panopticon as you seem to be insinuating, but yet there are uh, practices in well, yeah. Well, yeah, and again, you know, I really, this is a dangerous question because I, I risk uh, dissing a generation that I actually are pretty closely tied to in terms of my own uh, kids and so forth. I don't think that that's the deal as much as it's, it's simply um, the commercial culture is, is basically takes performance for granted. I mean, the people that go on uh, Survivor and the people that go on these shows really kind of want to be discovered as performers. And I think that's a longer running thing. It's not just commercial culture. Uh, we are a performance culture. I mean, from birth to um, Murray Edelman, to Irving Goffman, to on and on and on. I mean, essentially, the 20th century American tradition is on the presentation of self in everyday life. And I think that, so it's not just a commercial cultural phenomenon. I think it's actually part of our conceptual vocabulary. It is not a shock to see that generation after generation of invocation this kind of worldview leads people to essentially see themselves primarily as performers. Um, is there something wrong with that? No. As long, I mean, I think as long as there's a zone or a domain where you hold out the possibility of having a seat, I think that's that's the key. Is, is the possibility of having a private life, a secret life, some aspect of yourself that is not simply part of overall spam for everyone to chew on. You know? And and but it's not primarily generational. I think it's primarily sequential and historical that this kind of thing is happening. Um, and I, you know, I'm not an alarmist necessarily because I think that there's something self-defeating about the attempt to make it by everything. It doesn't always show up what's really going on. As often as not, it just ends up, you know, hitting the wall. Yes? It seems to me that at the other end of that performance culture, which I agree with, and my own 15-year-old daughter is one of the ones who puts the journal up online and reads the journals of a bunch of people, who she only knows as journal posters. She doesn't know them in any other way. At the other end of that is a longing for evaluation because they spend endless amounts of time 
critiquing and evaluating the initial post by one person or another and deciding whether or not it's normal, whether or not it's a good thing or bad thing to do, whether it's a statement on this person's character. As adolescents have done, certainly they were doing it right. when I was an adolescent. Um, I, I think I still do it. Um, and it, it seemed to me as she was describing this sort of thing that it's a search for a sense of norms and what's allowable and how they'll decide for themselves what they're going to allow people to do without censure and without sanction. Uh, which again strikes me as perfectly normal and familiar as a fundamental adolescent behavior. But what struck me is that she didn't seem confident that all this circle of female friends of hers had an understanding of what larger society or even their own parents might consider acceptable or unacceptable behaviors. And they seem to be trying to work it out themselves, not against something, but in the absence of a norm that they right. otherwise might have been rebelling against. Yeah, that's kind of what Norman said earlier, is, is the whole idea of when, once, once you're exploited and know it, once you sense your own vulnerability, then you, you're brought up short. And we, we know that from predators on the internet and all kinds of stuff like that. But until you realize that it is perfectly normal, it's just now taken such a virtual and visual and self-performative disclosive dimension that it, it plays in in unlikely ways to other social tendencies. I mean, really, what we're talking about isn't a whole lot different from gossip. I mean, before there was any internet or buddy lists or anything, one of the ways we found out our norms, one of the ways we found out what was taboo and was not, was through the process that could be considered quite unscrupulous in other um, systems of thought or viscosity and whatever. And, and so there's nothing that dramatically different about it, it's just the technology itself that we come to. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone else. It, uh, as just a moment of transition, it seems appropriate we start our day by focusing on Thoreau, who, as Tom said, uh, didn't really like the 19th century, since Walt didn't much care for the 19th century either. <laughs> I promise no age jokes. I just couldn't help myself. We're, we're going to take a, a little bit of a recess here. We'll come back in about 20 minutes with a, a panel presentation of Walt's former students talking about uh, what he meant in their lives. And so please feel free to stretch your legs and move back.